In this extra of the Rama Blueprints podcast, we hear from one of the Mission District's beloved sons, Orlando Torriente. He talks about his life with the Real Alternatives Program and the challenges of healing from trauma. Here's Orlando Torriente in his own words. This is Orlando Antonio Torriente, born in Los Angeles, raised in the Mission by way of Havana, Cuba. And I'm an activist, a musician, a parent, and a homeboy. Well, interestingly enough, my mother moved us back to L.A. when I was 15, just about to turn 16. I went to L.A. and I didn't like it much. And ah. I got into a lot of trouble. I got incarcerated and I went to the California State Youth Authority. Mm -hmm. I got a six-year sentence. That kind of turned my life upside down. Right, right. After doing my time, almost three years, the day I was leaving, one of the guys that was working there, right, a counselor or a staff member, a cop, whatever you want to call him, he told me, hey, Torriente, we'll save a bunk for you. That was his parting shot. So as at this time, I'm about 17, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. That wounded me that that was the last words, you know, on my way out. Like, mm -hmm. And the thing that really struck was that during my time, I saw so many brothers get out and come right back. And I was like, fuck, man. So anyway, I got out of there and I, I went, moved around, bounced around. I was trying to stay out of trouble. I was trying to avoid going back to Los Angeles. My mother lived in LA and mm -hmm. my brother lived in San Diego. I had a girlfriend that I really liked in San Francisco. She said, come back here. And I came back, this was probably around 1980, and I was living with her, and I was on parole. I was looking for work all the time. Right. I would come to San Francisco, look for work. Very frustrating. Because of my experience at rap, somehow I, I stumbled upon rap again. At that time, they had just moved the school to... 1950 right, Mission. Right, 1950. And their administrative offices were still at 23rd and Florida. And so I would go by and I'd see Mitch, I'd play basketball. Like I'd come in my little work, looking for work clothes with a little <laughs> tie and shit. And I get frustrated by how I go to two or three interviews and fuck this. I'd go and I'd go play basketball at rap and started talking to some folks there and telling them about my story, mm -hmm. about being in YA, being incarcerated, what that was like. And somehow, Speaking to Mitchell, he was like working as a school aide, teacher's aide at the time, because Elisa was the executive director. They were like, yeah, we're going to start this new program, mm -hmm. and it's going to be called Por Vida. And we're going to do substance abuse education and prevention, but it's going to be, you know, rap at that time was all about youth empowerment and giving the youth a voice. And... uh so they were like, we're going we're gonna to have this program. We're going to create this thing, and you should apply for the job. Because, you know, I could rap. Even back then, I was pretty sure. I was like, the gift of gap. <laughs> you had the gift of gap, you know? right, right. And so anyway, I did, and they hired me. And I think the first people hired for that program was Mitchell, myself, I think a guy called Eddie Gutierrez, and Angela, this girl from Fresno. Anyway, we were the first one. And maybe um, another sister mm -hmm. also from Valencia. Uh, from Valencia Gardens? Yeah, Yolanda, I think. So we started that program and we started from scratch and we were meeting with all these people that had programs previously in the Mission District. We did all this research. We had consultants working with Concha and Esperanza and, and we were going up and setting things up at Juvenile Hall and we hit the ground running, you know, and actually it was a really dynamic program. It was a seven week series of presentations that would cover from the history of drugs to the legal side of drugs, the side effects of drugs, some of the negative effects pharmacological uses for wow. drugs like it was pretty thorough wow so we would we would go and we would do this whole seven week series of presentations and we targeted 
young people. Of course, it was created by and presented by young people. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was still, you know, a young guy. A youngster, I, yeah. You you're know, I'm pretty young. <laughs> but yeah, it was really a well done series of presentations and information that we created. And we would go into schools, juvenile hall, community-based organizations, parent groups. We would run this informational preventative series of workshops. And how was that for you doing that work? It was really cool, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was it was really cool. I think that you know, at that time, the mission was experiencing a bit of a epidemic. You know, yeah. a lot of cats were losing their lives. Their PCP was really right. big at the time. So you'd hear every now and then of like some guy drowned, you know, several cats drowned or fell off a bridge or had a car accident or a fight or something. And a lot of it was linked to PCP use and other drugs were also mm -hmm. starting to become prevalent uh you know the crack thing was just in its infancy and that was really becoming an issue too but it was very rewarding to be able to go into these schools and in juvenile hall although i always tell the story that that was a real challenge at that time the director of juvenile hall was uh this guy foot f-o-o-t yeah I think. and he was a director and he was just with all due respect he was a pig yeah, you know what I'm saying yeah. he looked like a pig, <laughs> acted like a pig, you know, in the sense of what a pig was yeah. in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? I hear you. I hear you. Um, and he represented that physically and emotionally and everything. And uh, we went up there to juvenile hall, man, fired up because this was needed, right? Mm -hmm. These are our people are here, and we went in there. And so he invited us to a meeting, and he sat behind his big desk, and he was like. Well, what gives you the uh, think that you can come in here and do this kind of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know he did that that little thing that right. people in in these positions will do to kind of like throw you off like intimidation right? exactly like make you feel like you're not right. worthy the kind of like the Wizard of Oz thing right? oh yeah hiding behind the curtain <laughs> pulling the string. right so he pulled that and he got us right we started questioning ourselves and so we came back to rap right nineteen fifty with the tail between our legs, kind of like, like, oh, man, you know, he said, we, we're we not qualified, and, you know, we don't have the paperwork, and we're not this, man. Nah, and, you know, it was crazy, right? The first thing they did, they called Jim Queen, and they said, oh, get Jim over here, and we're going to meet with Jim. And Jim, he laid it down on us. He goes, hey, he's not the expert. Where are these kids from? They're from the mission. Where are their struggles in the mission? You know, where are you guys from? You're from the mission. You guys are young people. You know exactly what these kids are going through, right? Or wow. you just got out of YA. You know what I'm saying? You know what this institution is about. And he goes, you guys are the experts. Mm. Don't be intimidated. Like you said, he doesn't know a thing about those kids. He won't even step into one of their houses. Mm -hmm. He won't even go to the mission. When he goes home, he gets in his car and probably commutes 40, 50, 60 minutes to Sonoma or, you know, Napa or who knows where, Brentwood. Mm -hmm. He goes, you guys live here, and those kids are from here. You're the experts. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you're not qualified mm. to work with young people. Young people are the experts on what young people need. Wow. And I was like, man, after that, I could tell you from that day on, I was empowered in a way. No person could sit in a suit and tie behind a desk and tell me shit again. That's not to say that I didn't respect their position and what they had to offer, but that in no way made them any better than me or any of these other young people because he not only empowered me with that kind of talk, but he also empowered me to empower other young people. Wow. Like, I'm a young man, right? I just got out of way. I mean, I don't want to incriminate myself. But oh, I, I, I used to, you know, I used to pack and, you know, like Go the ahead. streets were the streets. We were still from the community. And the people that we were dealing with were like, at that time, we were so 
close to the streets. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I was still very connected to the streets. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing anything, but there was an element and a different attitude at that time to drinking and partying right. and stuff like that. Right. I can speak for myself. I was burning the candle on both ends. Right. Like, Let's talk about that. Doing community work, you know, and we partied hard too. I'm about 22, 21, 22 years old. So I'm hanging out, living. I'm on parole, of course, so I had to keep keep it kind of in mind. But doing this work, it was very difficult, very difficult, because on one side there was an expectation that, okay, you have a responsibility, you know, you're all counselor or whatever, you're representing. Wearing your, ja- your yeah, badge. Yeah, you're putting your little bit, whatever. Your jacket. But on the other side, right, there's right. a reality, too, that I ain't like Mr. Foot <laughs> getting in a car and driving two hours. When I got off work from, you know, 1950 Mission Street, I walked up Mission Street to my apartment on 25th in the alleyway behind, uh, you know, Valencia. I was living in the Mission District, and I was very much involved in a lot of stuff. It was a double-edged sword because on one side, it made us very effective. Whenever there was an issue, like I'm talking about life or death situation. Yeah, I hear right? you. Where I somebody, hear you. somebody got stabbed and... These guys are rounding up the crew to go handle their business, right? We, and I'm talking about myself and like Eddie Gutierrez and Robert Velas, we had the credibility and the respect on the streets that we could go talk to these guys and tell them, nah, you're not going to stand do that. down, right? You know what I'm saying? If there was an issue uh, with other nefarious activities that were going on <laughs> in the community, and they needed to be addressed, we could do that because people knew that we were real, real cats. But at the same time, it left us open and exposed. You know, right. I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict, so I just put that out there. Ain't no shame in my yeah, game. Right, right. And at this point, I worked at RAP, and then I was hired to work, I think, right around 1984, 85. You know, of course, the AIDS uh, right. epidemic exploded and I was always really good at doing presentations mm-hmm. right because I was bilingual I spoke English and you're Spanish. charismatic charismatic you know <laughs> you got the, whatever yeah. you know I, I just wasn't I was a fool I wasn't scared you know I guess <laughs> you could say after Jim pep talked me I'm like I can do anything right, <laughs> right. thanks Jim Jim said Jim. rap was a place where you can make your dream come true mm-hmm. you can become anything you wanted to become you know, Jim was, he was so phenomenal. He said something, always stood with me. He said, look, man, people will mystify what they do. You can train Jim to go do any job. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it doesn't matter what the job is. Once you get on the job, no matter how much experience you got, they're going to show you how they do it. Mm-hmm. No matter what you know or what you do. <laughs> really, like once you get the job, it's like, Okay, they're going to tell you what to do. And yeah, some things you got to have that paperwork and that experience. But overall, most jobs are mystified. They make them look much more important than yeah. they really are. Uh, so you got another job, you said, yeah? So what I went that? to work with the uh, Instituto Familiar de la Raza. Ah. Um, they just had a new program that they were starting. At the time, it was the uh, AIDS epidemic was hitting. And all of the information that was coming out was being produced by the San Francisco AIDS Project, Mm. which was information that was being produced by and for white college-educated men, Mm. gay men. Great. God bless them. But that left a lot of people out. Like the stuff that they were talking about really wasn't going to catch any traction with Latino grandmother, the young Latino kid in school, the sister who's working the streets to get little bread on the table or the guy who's getting ready to shoot up some dope, you know, and maybe trick in on the side to make some money. Like they weren't hearing all that stuff. So there was a tremendous need. Our communities were being affected. And so once again, the community to the rescue, Concha, uh, Estela, and people said we need to do something for our people. And so they created this program, the Latino AIDS Project. And they were like, hey, man, we need somebody because we're going to talk to young people about this. Let me tell you, 
there was a huge stigma back at that time. Yeah. We'd be talking about it. So that was a big leap for me. And I was like really nervous, man. I don't know what the homie is going to think, yeah. you know? <laughs> which is not important anyway. But I don't think people really understand the level of stigma around HIV and AIDS mm-hmm. at that time. Incredibly difficult. But they wanted me to do that job because they thought I could reach some people. Mm-hmm. They needed to go into schools and talk about this. It was urgent. So I was one of the first people they hired, man, and we created Similar to the Por Vida thing, we had this educational program that we were doing, and we were going everywhere, farm workers and Central Valley, schools, this and that, different organizations talking about HIV and how you can protect yourself. We did a video, Old Skin Van, and interestingly enough, what coincided with that time was that I really started slipping off into my addiction to uh, so that was very stressful work man it was really taking a lot i was seeing people die and it was really scary one of the things we want to show is about the resilience of people yeah. and i heard stories right i heard stories of you um coming out of that struggle mm-hmm. it was a real hard time in your life right mm-hmm. how did you come back i think one of the things that i have to say is that it was difficult for me People don't realize I never had anybody up here. But I was here, and I didn't really have yeah. anybody. The community was really important to me, and I did. I was messing up. You know, it was really obvious. But that was the beauty of, of the being a part of this, you know, is that we don't eat our own. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? People got to me. Ernesto, Yolanda Ronquillo oh. worked with the Latino AIDS Project, Concha, you know, Roberto Hernandez, but Ernesto in particular. But, you know, those people saw me struggling. And they, in a beautiful, loving way, kind of nudged me to get some help. And I did. I went into treatment. I went to Walden House. Mm-hmm. That was really a lifesaver for me. It's quite the experience. I'd like to say that that was the end of the road or like yeah. the end of my story. But no, I had to go out do some other <laughs> other experimentation but um, i think the point i want to make yeah. is that that was not uncommon and i think that we are really just starting to understand the level of trauma and how that trauma can be transferred onto not only the people that have experienced the trauma but the people that are helping those work through that trauma, Mm -hmm. you know? And again, we were just starting to understand and the culture was starting to change around how open and how accepting we were to that, whether it was drinking or smoking or snorting or whatever your way of dealing was, we were starting to change our ideas on that as a tool for dealing with our shit or dealing with the stress and trauma that we were dealing with. So I want to be very clear about that. For me, I took it to, you know, I took it to extreme levels, right? I'm right there with you. Um, Partly because I didn't deal with that stuff. I came right out of it and went to work right off the bat. So um, I never really had an opportunity. Like I got out of Wahe and started helping other people. And I was that was my benefit, right? That trauma was really one of my greatest assets that I was able to take that and help other people. But at some point, I realized that I needed to work through that. And mm-hmm. I had been deferring it by just numbing myself in order not to deal with it. But mm-hmm. it got to the point where that wasn't working anymore. So I had to step away from community work like many people often do and get my house kind of in order right your personal house right and i learned that for me personally i had to come in and out i had several different incarnations doing work i worked usf i worked at walden house my initiation at rap carried me through so many different community-based organizations (laughs) but my foundation was always what I learned at RAP. The empowerment that I got at RAP 
gave me what I needed to be successful in every single working relationship mm -hmm. that I developed mm -hmm. from that point on. When you start speaking about the trauma that you carried, somebody said yesterday, you know, we're hurt people trying to help hurt people. And I relate to the community doesn't eat their own um, because in my own challenges and in my own work, you know, I carried the heavy load of being the director at the rap school and some heavy duty shoes to fill, but just the trauma about burying children and kids that weren't mine, you know? Yeah. And when you speak to, well, you guys know what that feels like, right? Yeah. I didn't have any family up here yeah. and my family became rap. And as I was struggling and going through my own self-medicating and stuff and then getting cancer, it was the community here that surrounded me with love and support and brought me back out of that, you know, and I'm sober, you know, 20 years. Yeah. But it was this community that surrounded yeah. me. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. If I could add on no, to yeah. that, because it was such a blessing working with people like Rowan, who at the mm -hmm. time when I was very young, she just came on and she was running the group home. And they brought a spiritual element to the work that we were doing. The connection with Danza, it helped me like reconnect to my spirituality. My mother was a Santera, and there are so many parallels in that indigenous belief system. And so it was like to see Makwi and the different groups doing their danzas and their different ofrendas and the different rituals, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. scene and mm -hmm. for it was like transformational and extremely profound. I think that that was a big part of what kept us so connected and that allowed us to embrace each mm -hmm. other and take care of each other. I mean, I can't even tell you how important mm -hmm. that was, you know, mm -hmm. that we had that element. And I think after that, you started exploring your voice, right? You mm -hmm. sing and you give your love that way. Talk to me a little bit about how you evolved into that. Yeah, the music thing was, you know, I've always loved music. I it's funny, no, neither of my parents can sing a lick, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, they're not musicians, but they were very passionate about music. And I grew up, I can remember yeah. some of my earliest memories of just seeing, like, those albums uh, along the oh, wall. Yeah. You know, just albums and the images of, like, Mongo Santa Maria and Orquesta Broadway and, you know, Johnny Pacheco and Orquesta Arago. You know, the music was always there. And it really was rap Again, rap is so incredibly powerful in what they did for me. I could never pay them back, those people. But they helped me find myself. Mm -hmm. They pointed me towards the inward journey. Because like many of us who came up in that era, right, we went to schools where we weren't allowed to speak our language. Our culture wasn't taught. We didn't see images of ourselves reflected in the pages of the books that we were being told to read. And that was a big trauma for me. So rap helped me to reconnect with that. Study, learn about your history, learn about Cuba, learn about Haiti, learn about Mexico, learn about the Incas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the these beautiful civilizations that our history was greater than what we've been told. And that really freed me. The music was always there. Was a, being a part of this community, all the arts, Juan Alicia here, Rene Yanya there, you know, Yolanda Lopez here, Cookie Dory, Mike Rios is over there. Dancer. These different bands, you know, right. musicians, right. all the arts, everything was intertwined in the Mission District. Everything was connected. And so everybody that did community work within that, there was always musicians. And so I just, you know, my compadre Jose worked at Horizons. He invited me to a rehearsal one day. I started singing, man. And that kind of took off into its own thing. And it really was a healing outlet for me to mm -hmm. do music mm -hmm. and to be able to contribute in that way. If you were to look at yourself at 15 and with all the experience and the lived experience you have and the life experience and everything you've gone through, what would you tell that 15-year-old boy, that 15-year-old Cubano who's trying to experience life? What words of advice would you give that individual? Well, I, I tell hey, dummy, you're, 
<laughs> you're not going to be dead by 25. Which oh, is, I really okay. believe that. I really believe like that's such a tough question. You yeah. Know? I think I would have told that young man, enjoy it. Not be so hard on himself. Mm -hmm. The suggestion I would have given him was to go to school, get your paperwork in order. Yeah. I think if I'd have gotten a degree, I could have done done more, particularly within the community. And I would have probably said, go see a therapist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, don't wait so long. You know? <laughs> go see a therapist. Thank you for your work, uh, your commitment, your corazón, and for your beautiful voice. You know, oh, man. Thank you. love so, to hear you sing. Yeah, Muchas thanks. gracias, and uh, thank you again for today. Thank you for listening to this extra, which are intended for the listener to get a deeper understanding of the series as a whole. This extra was produced by Darren J. De Leon and Socorro Gamboa for the Five Sisters Audio Party. And remember, to listen is to heal. All power to the people.